Hi everyone and welcome to video number 10, our final video for unit four, Expansion, Regionalism and Reform from 1800 to 1848. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the society of the South and the early, in the early Republic. In the last one, we talked a lot about African-Americans in the early Republic. And in this one, we're going to be looking more at white Southern society to understand a little bit about what direction we'll be heading when we get into unit five, which of course will be about sectional divide and ultimately the civil war. So let's get into it. So let's start with how did Southern leaders codify their control over the South by creating a strong sense of white unity through Southern tradition or a sense or an idea of Southern tradition. So a little bit about white society to begin with, there were sort of different classes of white society. Now the aristocracy, quote unquote, of the South were the wealthy planters who owned at least 100 enslaved people and a thousand acres of land, much of which, of course, would be cultivated cotton cultivation. Uh, these aristocracy, these wealthy planters absolutely dominated the state legislatures. And of course, they're going to enact laws that were favorable to themselves to maintaining economic and political control for the very wealthy plantation owners. Uh, below the aristocracy, you're going to have your farmers. These are going to be slaveholders with less than 20 enslaved people. They're going to leave, live much more modestly than the wealthy planters. And then at the bottom, and this was three quarters of all whites in Southern society, are going to be the poor whites. These were white people in the South who did not own enslaved people, and they work their farms as subsistence farmers rather than as plantations. And finally, uh, sort of at the very edges of Southern society, you have frontier communities, you have the mountain people, frontier communities in places like the Appalachian and the Ozark Mountains. These were areas that were very isolated from the rest of the South, and they could have mixed opinions on slavery, but often they actually disliked slavery. Sometimes they saw it as competition for jobs. So they were not all uh, for slavery in these communities. So a little bit about the characteristics of white society, in white Southern society in the sort of antebellum period. Now, can be in mind that it was mostly rural, as you may have Glean from the last few uh, videos we've done. Only New Orleans was really the was the only really truly large city. There were very few large cities, and what existed were all in port cities on the coastal areas. Most of the land was rural. Cotton was absolute king. As cotton cotton became the basis of the economy, thanks to. Eli Whitney's cotton gin and a huge amount of demand for cotton from England uh, and from the North for manufacturing and textile industry. Uh, as this became the base of the economy, political life is going to be really increasingly focused on the absolute necessity of maintaining slavery as a system of labor to help to continue the wealth that is coming from these plantation farms. We're also going to see this sort of cultural sense of this code of chivalry. White planters felt they had a very strong sense of personal honor, uh, defense of white womanhood, and a very paternalistic attitude towards inferiors. The idea that inferiors in life, well, they have to be cared for. They're not like us. They're not true adults. They're childlike. They're children. And yes, this is going to be African Americans in general and enslaved people in particular that they will see as people that need to be cared for like children. Uh, education was pretty limited in the South. Uh, college education existed only for male upper class children. The lower classes rarely got more than primary education. If that, uh, mostly the upper classes are going to bring in tutors for their children. There is not a public school, a strong public school uh, education, a strong public school tradition, unlike we what we see developing in Massachusetts in the Northeast. And by the way, we can still see the strains of this in the United States today, I mean, the strongest and best educational systems today actually exist in the Northeast and Massachusetts and Connecticut. And some of the weakest public education systems exist in Southern states. So, so this, this, this has echoes into our modern day for sure. In terms of religion, uh, Methodists and Baptists both preach the support for slavery. So these are going to be very popular denominations in the South. You may recall that denominations like uh, Methodists and Baptists emerged out of the first Great Awakening. And um, reform movements, the reform movements we talked about a couple of video go videos ago, those reform movements had very little impact in the South. The Southerners were really committed to tradition and the Southern way of life or what they perceived as the Southern way of life, or at least the white Southern way of life. So let's talk a little bit about that. 
Uh, I, sorry, before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about yeoman farmers. So these were poor whites. These are the kind of yeoman farmers of Jefferson's conception. Uh, these are the majority of white farmers in the South. They did not have enslaved workers. They were independent farmers who worked their own lands and owned more or less self-sustaining family farms. Now, these young women farmers, because they didn't own slaves, you would think maybe they were less in support of slavery, but most of them believed in slavery. A few people challenged the planter elites, especially in Western states. A few called for gradual abolition of slavery because they could see how the slavery of the system of slavery disadvantaged them. I mean, they had to work all day with their own, own hands in order to compete with white planters who were working by using slaves, who were not working at all, who were just using the labor of someone else. So increased voting rights in the 1830s and 1840s for the commoners, as we talked about with Jackson in previous videos, uh, they really sought, sought to influence state legislatures. But Cotton was king, as we said, the planter aristocracy had a really strong control over state legislatures, um, and they were limited in what changes they could make. And, and, and the planter aristocracy really made a concerted effort to try to unify and create a white tradition in the South that unified all white Southerners, including those poor whites, the yeoman farmers. Okay, so now we're going to talk about that. So we're going to see that some challenges to white planters from external, you know, impacts, uh, external influences, uh, nations like Europe and Latin America are going to begin to abolish slavery. Britain emancipated slaves in 1834, and this is going to influence and grow the U.S. abolitionist movement. Uh, but they were also able to unify the larger population of Southern whites to help them maintain political control. So the first of all, the three-fifths compromise that was baked into the Constitution ensured that states that had the largest enslaved populations had a larger voice in Congress than they really should. Think about it. You've got three-fifths of enslaved people are counting as population, which means those groups are getting more representatives because of those three-fifths of enslaved populations. And yet, the representatives, of course, are not representing the voices of those slaves. They're, invent they're representing only the voices of that small, mostly planter aristocracy, wealthy elite. So they, and whoever had whatever states had the most slaves had an outsized voice in Congress because they got more representatives than they really should have because they were representing people that had truthfully no voice, but they were claiming to represent. This very tiny elite planter class with many slaves had a huge political influence, as we said, and they worked really hard to use that political influence. They often made loans to those who were in need. They hired poor whites. They used resources to transport crops of yeoman farmers to the market, and they kind of did this all this to incentivize poor whites to not mess too much with the system of slavery. And this is going to become increasingly important in the 1830s and 1840s as commoners, as common farmers had, and common laborers had a big bigger voice in government. So how do we unify white society? Okay, in the 1830s, white planters worked really hard to coalesce the white population in the South all around the idea of white supremacy. This was a unifying idea for all classes of whites, especially poor whites who were really at the bottom of society. Well, it was possible for white planters to say, well, you may be the bottom of white society, but you're not the bottom of society because enslaved people are still beneath you. It gave them someone to have beneath them that they could feel superior to. So advocates, and then there were a lot of advocates like Thomas Dew, for example, or John C. Calhoun, that argued that slavery was actually good, was positive. And this is definitely a shift because the founders, like Washington and Jefferson, who owned slaves, they were actually you know, somewhat tormented and conflicted about slavery. They had moral reservations. They felt it was necessary economically, but they did have some moral reservations. And in truth, many of them sort of hoped that slavery would just, as I said, sort of peter out on its own eventually, sort of naturally. But this idea will change by the middle of the 19th century as the slavery becomes increasingly important to the economy because of industrialization and the demand for raw material like cotton. The argument that slavery is justifiable, not just on economic grounds, but also more moral grounds, really gains a lot of uh popular thought. The argument here is that slavery is the core of Southern society, that this institution holds it together, the quote unquote pe peculiar institution 
holds together Southern society in this sort of paternalistic institution in which, theoretically, the white plantation owners at the top act in the best interest of everybody, including the people they enslaved. The planter elites worked really hard to forge bonds with the lower white classes based on these ideas of white supremacy. So this helps to really unify them and prevents an undermining of the system of slavery from within Southern society. So instead of poor white Southerners saying, hey, this isn't fair, uh, we are disadvantaged by the system of slavery, we want to get rid of it. You have white Southerners, poor white Southerners say, no, 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 this is vital to the Southern way of life. That, you know, if we have anything else, it'll be anarchy and we need this because you know, the white planters, the Southerners at the top are really caring for this institution that enslaved people, were they to gain their freedom, wouldn't know what to do with it. And they would just need someone to care for them. They would be a burden on society, which of course is absolute, you know, bull honky. Obviously it's ridiculous, but this was definitely the argument. This was the moral justification. Increasingly in the middle of the 19th century, it was seen not just as an economic necessity, but as a moral and positive good for society in the South. And this is really going to lead us right into Unify, where we will begin to talk about sectional divide and ultimately the Civil War. So I will see you guys next time for our videos on Unit 5.